Or will Batman go Zonk or Zowie? But we'll know soon after next week's premiere. In the meantime, Barb Brown has another Hollywood caper making a film of the caped crusader. At the beginning, uh, I drew him as a vigilante, very mysterious, so dark and brooding. We've grown up with Batman. He's a cultural hero. Not evil, but he's got that dark side to him. And you can write ten volumes on a character like this and still not get what he's about. Fighting crime and rescuing the, the beautiful damsels in distress. And he's still doing it for, you know, the betterment of man. So it's very simple when you put all the ingredients together. And just come up with a Batman. It's hard to imagine another comic book character who's been subjected to so many interpretations. And in Batman's 50th anniversary year, there's one more on the way. In this London recording studio a few weeks ago, musicians were adding the final notes to Batman, the movie. For a summer full of blockbusters, an expensive project with an unusual group of collaborators. So we got boom, boom, boom. let's add our splash. Danny Elfman, a star with an eight-man rock group called Boingo Boingo, composed a score for a 110-member symphony orchestra. Another rock artist, Prince, wrote songs for some of the scenes. I wouldn't want to do it just to do it. but if it And Tim Burton, scenes, only yeah. 29 years old when he was hired to direct the feature, came with a reputation for an offbeat way of seeing things, including the pressures of handling a shooting budget of more than $32 million. You're never prepared unless until you've done one of these things. It's like a, an out-of-body or death experience. I mean, who's, who's to say what it's like when you die? and you see the lights above the set and you see it becomes like a circus, a, a surreal circus, which I love. Burton is one of the hottest young directors in Hollywood, a former Walt Disney animator whose approach, like Batman's, is decidedly out of the mainstream. For example, one of Burton's earliest films was this live-action short called Frankenween, about a little boy who brings his dog back to life. Several mothers were dragging their children out of the theater. I don't know why, but, you know, I just... <laughs> I just don't know what this means. It means you don't have to go through house breaking another dog. You know you haven't petted him yet? It was a funny send-up of the Frankenstein stories, but the Disney Studios decided not to release it. For Batman, the stakes have changed. The funny thing about Batman is, is that I have this encyclopedia and, you know, I tried to get a sense of the history of the character and it just changed, you know, from decade to decade. It was not like... One of the first things that Burton learned was that although Batman may be a comic book character, he's been analyzed and interpreted through several generations of fans. We look into that explosion as Batman and Robin take over. Over the years, there was the low-budget Batman from the 1940s Hollywood serials who had to change in the back seat of a Batmobile that looked like it came off the lot at below sticker price. But when the generation that cheered these Saturday serials grew up and its own kids, they would find a new interpretation of their hero just down the road. In the 60s, Batman surfaced again as a campy kind of crusader. That offended those hardcore fans. Sometimes I think people expect too much of us, Batman. They have a right to expect it. But it created a craze. This was an era when, as everyone did their own thing, it looked like a darker tomorrow might never come for the caped crusader. But in his new incarnation for the 80s generation, Batman is a complex hero of graphic novels, reflecting an era when crime has grown to create new levels of fear and frustration, and everyone seems to bend the rules, and Batman has had about as much as he can take. That's the image this generation of fans has in mind when they describe their Batman. A dark hero. 
It's like it's like calling dark hair in two words. Break the rules a little bit, but still get away with it. He's a big guy, you know. He's, right. he's in, in in the comic. He's he's six foot two ten, so he's a big guy. Attention, King Workshoppers. That's why there was a controversy when actor Michael Keaton, who had previously worked with Burton in the film Beetlejuice, was cast to play Batman. That is why I won't do two shows a night anymore, babe. I won't. I won't do it. Well, but Burton had his reason. Now, I had seen lots of actors who would fit probably a more physical image of Batman, but I just always had trouble, when I imagined them, putting on a bat suit. And uh, Michael... You know, I just look at Michael, and I could, you know, enough said, really. You know, I could see him putting on a bat suit. Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! What are you? I'm Batman. The film's producers were concerned enough about fan response to rush a trailer into movie theaters far ahead of schedule. It worked so well that the trailer drew applause in theaters, not only for Keaton, who looked convincing as an 80s-style Dark Knight, but also for the casting of Jack Nicholson as Batman's demented foe, me, the Joker. Wait till they get a load of me. <laughs> In addition, an expert whose interpretations couldn't be disputed was hired as a consultant to the film. He is Batman's creator, Bob Kane. He doesn't have superpowers. So Batman could be you and he could be uh, Tom, Dick, or Harry. And I think therein lies the, the secret to the crusader that probably in most of us, we, we all feel like fighting back, but we don't either have the inclination or the opportunity or the desire to. So Batman fights our battles for us. But why does he fight them in such a bizarre costume? Kane says he was inspired to make his crusader dress like a bat after seeing drawings by Leonardo da Vinci and putting that idea together with a strange character in another Hollywood film titled The Bat Whispers. Third influence was uh, Zorro. And I got all the swashbuckling daring do from Marco Zorro. Had the dual identity, the boy, playboy during the daytime, who fights against oppression at night as a crusader against all injustice. And he came out of a cave on a black horse tornado. Obviously, you see all the influences. Instead of the horse and the, the cave, I use the Batmobile. And to leave the grotesque gallery of villains, Kane turned to another weird influence. A 1928 film titled The Man Who Laughs. It's a story about a, a kid who had his face slashed into a ghastly smile by rival gypsies. So he grew up into a ghastly looking character with this white face, this ghastly red lips. That's where I got the Joker from. When you see certain images, you know, like a little chemical is released in your brain. <laughs> One image that comes to mind is uh, the, the Joker character having a conversation with the corpse, which I quite like. Maybe we uh, give him a couple of days to think it over. No. It's funny. It's a bit scary. It's a bit... You know, it's a pleasant conversation, but it's with a blackened husk. I'm glad you did. In fact, much of the picture was designed around images and settings that in themselves became characters in the film. Burton wanted Gotham City to look as if hell had erupted from the sidewalks. And so here, on a carefully guarded lot at Pinewood Studios outside of London, was built a monumental essay in ugliness. The Gotham City set cost $2 million to build, and it's the size of a small amusement park, larger even than the Main Street area of Disneyland. But that's where the comparison stops. This view of an urban disaster area was cooked up for Burton by a graduate of London's Royal Academy of Art, Anton First who created an architect's nightmare. That, that was the intention, to maintain this completely bleak, miserable town and uh, start as a background. So, so, so we were gone to sort of grey stone, brown stone, concrete, 
But that, that was very much the finishes we were going for. And you can see... We tried to imagine going back in New York a hundred years and imagining how it might have developed had there been no city planning, had there been no authorities to control. To heighten the nightmarish effect that Burton wanted, many of the buildings are based on real designs that don't mix. This boilerplate look by Japanese architect Shen Takamatsu wound up fronting Gotham City's museum. A cathedral by Spain's Antonio Gaudí was transplanted to a location off Gotham Square. And the works of American architect Louis Sullivan were mixed in along the avenues, dwarfed by massive steel footings. When I went down there to see Gotham City when they were shooting, I started to get ideas. Tim had mentioned uh, a little gothic, a little bit operatic, uh, Burton turned to composer and rock artist Danny Elfman for one of the final touches. Video cassettes of scenes for Elfman were delivered to his home studio in California, where they were synchronized with a computer as Elfman laid out the score. Okay. I'm going to switch back and play the real thing for you. Okay. Vicky Vale, played by Kim Basinger. Vicky's wondering, who is this guy? She doesn't know. She's always trying to look at his face. So, he turns on the light in her eyes that she can't see. As you can see, it's a lot of fun dealing with the very legitimate and classical styles in one moment and then getting completely over the top in the next moment. It's almost like going back to an old film style. basic, old-fashioned style, hero, saving the day type of music. It's fun working in a theme that doesn't really have an era to it. This could have been from 1942 or something like that, just as easily. Riding on all of this is a total investment, including the film budget and promotion and marketing costs, estimated at well over $40 million a risk for Warner Brothers, the studio backing the film, a showcase for Burton, a former animator who is now being named by some critics as one of the young successors to the Steven Spielberg, George Lucas era. That's something he'd rather not think about. It always makes me a bit uncomfortable because, you know, the movie's not done yet and I, you know, I just want to make sure it's good before I start going, thank you, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Regardless of how the picture does, the Batman character on his 50th anniversary is in for a long ride this summer. More than 300 officially licensed products are already flooding the market. And there is one clear winner. The man who started it all when he was only 18 years old and who's been brought back in style for the party. You know, I've been getting calls every 20 minutes and uh, you're in all the magazines and all the news media. In fact, when I was riding down in, in Westwood the other day, and I saw this huge bat signal up on one of the billboards, so Batman has become an American icon. I'm enjoying it, absolutely. That's quite a project, Bob. You know, quite apart from the reader vote that liquidated his sidekick, Robin. In the, in the comic in, books. In the comic books, yes. Uh, there... Robin could have been included in this, couldn't it? And they didn't, they? He could have been. They chose not to because they were working so hard to create a kind of dark psychological motivation for a man who would dress up in a bat suit that they thought that adding a sidekick who also wore booties and a cape was a little no, too much. Under way. Maybe for a sequel. <laughs> Bob, have merchandisers gone out on a limb here because they've got millions of dollars of merchandise? Right, not as it. much for this movie as they would for a movie where the characters aren't as well known. This is Batman's 50th anniversary and the merchandise will sell well regardless. So they're pretty sure that they'll make out all right. Yeah, huh? I think so. Thanks, Bob. Well, when we come back, a life-saving device in automobiles. Suit society, but uh, give a call. We'd like